Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Uh, again, I'm Michael Hoyer. I'm IT Campus Technology Manager here for Cascade Campus. I've been with uh, PCC for 10 years. I've been working in technology for a long time, since the early 80s. And I uh, really wanted to get involved with Whiteness History Month and started doing a little research and found a topic that I got interested in. And so that's what we'll present today. You can see the title. Personal Computers and Community College Classroom Examine the User Interface, Whiteness, and Cultural Barriers. <clears throat> Here's a quick list of the presentation outline. We've got a lot of slides to cover, but I'm going to whip through them pretty quick. This presentation and the research paper that was created that serves the basis of it are available. If you'd like a copy, just email me at any time. Of course, with uh, Whiteness History Month, we're talking about context, consequences, and change. And this is a little context exercise that we can all take a look at. One other uh, presenter we have here is the empty chair. That represents alternate viewpoints to what we're going to present today. So where do we start? Well, this is pretty, uh, pretty well-known common knowledge. But at PCC, personal computer use is required for many of our processes and most of our classes. I found some information that describes the skills needed straight off of the PCC website. Com basic computer literacy skills in order to be students. Skills include things like using a mouse and Windows, keyboarding, documents, printing, saving, emailing, attachments, web browser. Computer skills are as fundamental as skills in reading, writing, and math. And for all students in all programs, so pretty comprehensive. <clears throat> There's an educator, author, and computer programmer named David Warlick. And what he said about this is, we need technology in every classroom and in every student's and teacher's hands, because it is the pen and paper of our time. And it is the lens through which we experience much of our world. So I want to uh, tee it up a little bit by talking about whiteness. If you've been to uh, any of these presentations prior to this one, you've seen different um, ter uh, descriptions of what whiteness is. And I took this directly off the pcc.edu slash WHM site. And it refers to the construction of the white race, white culture, the systems of privileges and advantages. And then it lists institutions, government policies, media, decision-making power, in corporations, schools, definitely PCC, judicial systems, etc. <clears throat> and it wasn't until I started attending some of the other Whiteness History Month presentations that I really got a new understanding of whiteness for myself. And I became quite inspired. And I put up this line graphic. Um, whiteness uh, depicts that whiteness is best, less white is not as good. But it doesn't stop there. And one of the uh, terrible things about whiteness is that it has to make the other end of the spectrum not just not as good, but bad. It's very uh, destructive. Whiteness is constantly refitting us into the line. So as we change as people and as society changes, whiteness is always positioning us somewhere along here. And, you, and it's not related to skin color. It's related to other aspects of ourselves. On a given day, you may be nudged over here or over here. I was at a presentation earlier this week, and uh, argument was made that some people of color, Obama, Eric Holder, Loretta Lynch, might be closer to this side, and definitely some white people might be closer to this side. Uh, whiteness in systems is destructive and divisive. Whiteness replaces life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness with death, oppression, and frustration. Whiteness is self-correcting. It's agile and adaptive. And it only has one goal, and that is the preservation of whiteness. That's my opinion. This is a very good uh, graphic. It's out of video number two. You can recognize the star of the video. Um, and this one was very interesting to me because, uh, as it listed some of the institutions and systems, the one that I saw missing was technology. And certainly that's an area that I work in. 
So I took the artistic liberty of adding it in. <laughs> That's the great thing about being the presenter. So the topic at hand is whiteness in personal computer user interface. User interface really means the screens, the things that we look at in the personal computer. And of course, our framework for Whiteness History Month is the three C's. So the context, this, this presentation is largely about context, and we're going to spend a lot of time on slides about context. The consequences is, is that whiteness in personal computer screens, just like whiteness in all other systems, presents obstacles, and primarily for our students here at PCC. And then change. You know, I'm, I'm going to state at the end of the presentation that I think the era of the PC is, is waning. It's uh, ramping down. And maybe we need to look at that. It might be time to move away from the reliance on the personal computer as this tool that we direct students to for coursework, and especially things that relate to their grades. So how do we look at uh, people and computers? Well, there is a field of study called human-computer interaction. And that is a framework developed in the 70s by some scholars and, uh, and other experts. And it really breaks down the interaction between people and computers. And so this is kind of like the uh, fundamental uh, theoretical rationale for picking apart technology and people. You can read here along, it researches the design and use of computer technology, focusing on the interaction between the people and computers. We start off here with people, also known as users. Uh, the computer, as we all know, the graphics, the OS, programming languages, and the development environments. And then the way humans are researched, especially with technology, is with communication theory, linguistics, language plays a very important part, social sciences, cognitive psychology, social psychology, and human f uh, factors such as satisfaction and frustration. And the definitive uh, resource to start is Wikipedia, but you can find a lot of stuff on this. <laughs> and there's a graphical model for human-computer interaction. This was developed by uh, some scholars, but uh, notably John Carroll, which is one of the forefathers of HCI, and adopted by Association for Computing Machinery, ACM. And they really provide a lot of the uh, basis for uh, describing technology and computers. They've been around a long time. I've been to some conferences of theirs. It's a busy diagram, but I wanted to point out some areas that we use to research further to find whiteness in personal computer UI. So up here is the users. and have social organization and work, certainly a cultural thing. Over here are the individuals, how people process information, communication again, and language. The, the computer graphics, which is really the connection between the things going on in the computer and the people. <clears throat> And then down here, very important, the development process. These are the programmers, the system engineers, the people creating the system. And this has been uh, adopted by technology as a standard for looking at HCI. One of the, thing, one of the takeaways that HCI lets us make is that cultural background really matters. It does matter. And the cultural background of the user, as well as the team that develops the system, make a difference in that interaction. When we look at users, the things that they bring to it <clears throat> are their age, experience with technology, attitudes about work, religion, family relationships, attitudes about Western technology, identity, race, certainly. And this is uh, cited by Gilbert Cockton, who did a lot of research on HCI. Then we also have the cultural background of the system developers, the programmers, the ones creating the system. Some conclusions made by some researchers are that system developers really rely on their own skills, their own preferences when developing something. They're uh, predisposed for developing something that works for themselves. And here's a, a quote from a, a book by Alan Cooper called The Inmates Are Running the Asylum about technology development. The programmer's mind, the demands of the programming process not only supersede any demands from outside world 
of users, we've now put people in the parentheses and moved users up front. But the very languages of the two worlds are at odds with each other. So they focus more on the machine stuff. And there's view of system design as systems to be embodied social and behavioral claims about the needs, abilities, and activities of the users. So it's really a social construct. And the gap between system developers and users may be less significant than the influence of stakeholders on the system developers. And this is from Rob Kling, who wrote a piece called Cooperation, Coordination, and Control in Computer Supported Work. But these conflicts involve power relations between higher and lower status employees, between managers and their subordinates, and between teachers and students. And for users, challenges with computer systems are measured in frustration level. Does that resonate with anybody? Mm -hmm. Definitely. And there's a definition of frustration with computers. When the computer acts in an unexpected way that annoys users and keeps them from realizing their task goals. Things that lead to this are non-intuitive screens, confusing error messages, unfamiliar icons, and complex language. Well, one of the things that we wanted to do before we even decided there was enough material for a presentation is to find evidence from other places. So it's not just what we found, but other sources. And on the PCC website, first of all, you can find anything on the PCC website. So if you ever want to do a presentation, go there. You're going to find something that helps you. But uh, there was a partnership between PCC and Intel, two leaders in our region. And what they did was create a program to provide technology and technology skills to Spanish-speaking families in Washington County. Well, I was kind of glad to find this for a couple reasons. One, it definitely acknowledges that culture matters because they didn't give computers just to certain families. They gave computers to Spanish-speaking families. So that acknowledgement of the cultural link was important to me. And then the other thing to, to highlight is it's, it's not just about access. You don't just give someone a computer. If we could just give everyone computers and it would get better, it would have already gotten better because a lot more people have computers now. There is a gap there. And there's a false assumption that computer usage is desirable for everyone. It's just not the case. You know, it's more satisfying to some and less satisfying to others. That's a real uh, component of whiteness in systems. And many people don't see a social back benefit. They find a lack of culturally relevant content. And we're going to come back to that. And I'm going to read a couple things here. This is from Three Dimensions of Racism and the Digital Divide in Education. And that's at edchange.org. The digital divide is understood too often as simple gaps in rates of physical access to computer and internet technology. In order to work effectively to dismantle the digital divide, we must understand it first and foremost as a symptom of larger forms of oppression, power, and privilege. The racial digital divide is a symptom of systematic, systemic racism. This is why attempts to solve it simply by adding more computers and internet access to classrooms and other public places has not worked. So HCI, cultural background and personal computers. So I make a leap here. Hope you're all willing to make it with me is that if cultural background matters, and I think we've shown that it does, can we then say that there's a cultural background that's more compatible with computer systems? I think so. Is it whiteness? Is there whiteness in personal computer systems? And here's another quote. This is from uh, Wired Man's Burden, The Incredible Whiteness of Being Digital. As the editors of Technicolor, Race, Technology, and everyday life right in their introduction to their essay collection. Narrators of the information revolution have regaled us with tales of hackers and geeks, and in the process have constructed technology as a site of white male superiority. Talk a little bit about the development teams that came up with uh, the personal computer user interface. This is that bottom level of the HCI model we showed. 
But uh, personal computer user interfaces came from Microsoft in Windows and Apple Mac. They were developed in the late 70s. And I want to look at some of the cultural characteristics of those development teams. Here's the Apple design team in 1978. Uh, Steve Jobs is lift, listed here. Um, it's all white people. And that's pretty much the whole team that uh, developed the user interface at the time. And I had some clothes like that, so. <laughs> uh, here's the Microsoft design team, same era, 1978. Again, these are all white people. And, uh, and uh, Bill Gates down there. But this is really the core teams. I also uh, Wikipedia at each member of these teams to see what their background was and just to make sure that I was uh, confidently saying they were all, all white members. And then let's talk about the communities that they resided in and what those looked like when they developed these user interfaces. Well, King County, Washington, 1980 census data, 88% white, that's where Microsoft is, and Apple in Cupertino, Cupertino, California, Santa Clara County, 1980 census data, 85% white. So what we have is white teams from white communities. So, I'll make a quick comment here. Is it impossible for all white teams coming from largely all white communities to develop a user interface that represents other points of view and other cultural backgrounds? No, it's not impossible. Do I think they were able to do that? I don't think so. So, what framework did they select? to develop the user interface. And they both came up with the same framework and context. Very interesting. And the context here is straight from context, consequences, and change. You might know what it is. We do. It was this, the business office. So the way they decided to develop the user interface is based on a business office paradigm. Um, this is a image I found on the internet, but you can see a lot of things here that were directly translated to the personal computer user interface. Got the desktop, got the inbox. Some of these documents probably have attachment A, so he's familiar with attachments. Probably not a recycling bin, I must say, though. <laughs> but definitely the trash, you know, throwing those documents away. And the whole business process, the norms, the flows, the standards, the way everything processes through a business office is what they selected. Well, let's look again at what was going on in the time when they developed those UIs. 70 plus percent of business office workers were white. If you look at leadership and management roles, the percentage was far greater. And they converted that business office desktop framework into the system that we see now. A lot of commonality between Microsoft Windows and uh, Apple Mac. And they selected metaphors. And we see a lot of these. These are some of the things I mentioned from the guy's business office, the desktop, the inbox, file folders, copy and paste. That used to be a physical exercise of copying, cutting, and pasting. Uh, attachments, the trash, the whole keyboard coming from typewriter background. Um, facts, a little newer, but depicting people as users. You know, there's, there's a user icon right there. And these are metaphors. And uh, there was a, uh, some research done by Pip and Barr from New Zealand called um, A Taxonomy of Microsoft Metaphors Used in Microsoft Office. And so it broke them all down into four or five different categories. But one of them is structural metaphors, and that's what these are. Here's what he said. An important issue with structural metaphors is that the transfer of facts about the real world system object is not a complete one and may lead to user confusion, frustration. This problem can be compounded further if an unsuitable real world concept is chosen as the representation. So if you're not familiar with the business office, this might not work for you. Is there whiteness in the computer user interface? Well, I think we've found some 
some evidence here. Both the teams were exclusively white, coming from largely white communities. The framework came from a business office setting, which was largely based on whiteness. But what I think is really warranted is more investigation. And when I was uh, looking at HCI, there are specialists that uh, can uh, do further investigation in technology areas. Specialists now in digital anthropology, linguistics, the language and technology and how it manifests itself, and technology psychology, what people think about technology as they're using it. And I suspect if they headed down this path, they'd find some whiteness in there too. So what are the consequences for students? That's the most important takeaway here. What does it mean for our students? Well, there is some evidence that students of color are negatively impacted by the whiteness that is in the computer user interfaces. Here's a couple studies. One study looked at uh, GRE test scores. These are high achieving students, right? They're taking the GRE. That's for graduate school. Students of color had higher scores with the paper and pencil test when compared with the online test. Another study looked at math test scores in Nebraska for students in grades 4, 8, and 11. Black and Hispanic students had higher scores with the paper and pencil tests. Those are consequences. More research is needed. So I've talked a lot about evidence. I want to find evidence in other areas. Found a little bit on the PCC website. Now I want to look in some other areas of technology. And I know this topic is of interest and it's timely because a reporter uh, contacted Abe to interview me last week about this topic just from seeing the little blurb about it in the Whiteness History Month calendar. And this is from a nationally circulated magazine that's been around since the 1920s with a circulation of 100,000 people. And she said, hey, I'm interested in this. I'm going to write about it and I'm doing a series of articles. So I thought, hey, maybe we found something here. Well, let's look in other areas of technology. If we see it elsewhere, then perhaps our assertion has merit. Here's one story that was in the BBC, but Google searches expose racial bias. Um, this has been uh, covered a lot in the press. And so I did some Google searching. Uh, I did it yesterday, so it might have changed by now. but. <laughs> uh, so I did this Google search, Time Magazine Cover Black Youth. This is what I got. Then I did the same search, Time Magazine Cover White Youth. And you get this one. But I want to step back from this a little bit because it's a Time Magazine cover, so that's a little slanted in one way. It's been searched many, many times, and Google uses the algorithm and everything like that. But uh, you know, this is a striking uh, uh, depiction of search results. But that's not exactly what the BBC article was about. What the BBC article was about was that when searches are determined to be black and have black terms and black language, the pop-up ads were things like criminal background check sites and bail bonds. And that was what the really, really the article was because the search algorithm is one thing, but then linking it to other content that is displayed changes and, and we talked earlier about the uh, culturally satisfactory content. That is not culturally satisfactory content for the users. Another article I looked at is uh, Atlantic Magazine. Facial recognition software might have a racial bias problem. It only works on white people. That's a problem. One of the main uh, customers for facial recognition system is the criminal justice system. I don't think that's going to go well if it doesn't work well for different skin colors. But let me talk also on this slide about whiteness and how whiteness works. I talked earlier about whiteness is self-correcting. It's agile. It's nimble. It only cares about preserving whiteness. <clears throat> and uh, so I did some other searching. And uh, at the same, right after I did these, I did a search term of urban white youth. And I got the search results in Google. And on, a, on the right-hand side, I got three ads. I got Converse high tops, some pretty cool looking like skate street shorts, and then uh, tank tops. Then I did the same search, urban youth black. And what I got was no ads. They just removed the ads. So the way they dealt with fixing this was just, we're not going to show any content. We can't figure that out. Just show nothing. 
That is not culturally relevant content. So let absolutely about uh, these uh, images, these search results. <coughs> were these the, the, the top results, or was, was there a bunch of other ones below them? Like, what did what did the page look like? Uh, like, I'm, I'm curious. Like the top three was. Mm -hmm. Uh, when I did this yesterday, those were the top res the number one result for each. Yeah. And uh, you guys, you guys know this. You search Google all the time. You can play around with this. So let's uh, look ahead at what's likely to change. Well, is are the development teams going to change markedly in the near future and start develop mo developing more culturally diverse? computer systems? Maybe not. Uh, the diversity statistics, this is from gigaom.com, for tech companies are, are bad. Um, system development teams are not diverse. The staff are mostly white. It's the purple over here. Asian is the red. A lot of Asians in high tech. But if you look at adding together the white and Asian representatives of these tech companies, they're about 80, 85 percent white and Asian. Uh, Apple does a little better down here, but this uh, article goes on to uh, explain that that's taken into account a lot of their retail store employees. And probably if we go to that next level we talked about, which is uh, managers, executives, and leaders in those companies, the percentages are very, very low. So this is going to continue to have an impact on system use and cultural background. Hi, can I just make a comment? I think it's very interesting that Cisco's line uh, is just white and not white. They did not report statistics for these colors. That's whiteness. So let me read this also from The Wired Man's Burden, which is an excellent article, Credible Whiteness of Being Digital by Mark Derry. An African American with a PhD in engineering from Stanford spoke for many when he described the force field of bigotry, invisible yet impenetrable, that thwarted his ambitions. Although he had the talent to start a company, complete graduate training at a top university, and raise $2 million from investors, the venture capitalists would not allow him to be the CEO of his own company. And let's wrap it up and bring it back to students. Student technology use. Ah, oh, well, it's changed. It's changed a lot. Um, students now prefer to use their smartphone. That's their uh, device of choice, not the personal computer. And we see that all the time. Um, I went to a conference uh, a couple weeks ago in Chicago, American <coughs> Association of Community Colleges, and took some of these statistics from a presentation done there. But 90% of community college students have smartphones. The selection of apps and the ability to personalize is huge. And that's important because now you can start to really tailor your own user interface. You can make changes about how your phone looks and works. You can change some of the stuff that used to be harder to modify. And there are many, many classroom apps available for smartphones. An uh, important point they made at the conference was don't take systems that were converted from personal computer and made to run on a smartphone. There's some stuff that is developed specifically for smartphones, and it works better on smartphones. It's for smartphones and for students. And I'm not an instructor, so it's a little easy for me to say what instructors should do, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, but we, and, and even as an institution, not just instructors, but we should consider alternatives to the personal computer for instruction and assignments, or maybe start to try and diminish the role that it plays in coursework, in uh, completing assignments, in testing. Certainly, if we're teaching someone about the computer, it's going to be largely on the computer. But uh, this is an important thing to consider. And when I think about change, I think that error is gone, you know? The personal computer is from 1978 has a, a much uh, less important role. That used to be the only access to the internet, the only way to use technology. Now we have tablets and smartphones and other alternatives. So maybe the era of that personal computer is coming to an end. I want to talk a little bit about, uh, last thing is the uh, 
The presentation I saw was by math instructor Nathan Kurtz of Glendale Community College and Sean Orr, she's a woman from Michigan Community College System. But they talked about mobile technologies that engage students in the learning process and help them master course content. They look at uh, processes for adaptive learning, educational gaming, and apps. And some of the apps were, were fascinating. Uh, there's a few uh, names here, MindTap, Erasma, and Kahoot. But I have a copy of their presentation, and if anyone's interested, we can get that for you. I'm glad to be here today. Thank you. Uh, uh, there's some advantages of going last, like because uh, I'm tired this week, and I don't have that much time, so I don't have to fill up that much time here. But uh, I'm going to talk about some important stuff, I think. Uh, one thing I wanted to talk about, where's the pen, is uh, getting involved with computers back in the day. When I did, you, you kind of... You kind of had to be familiar with electronics a little bit. It was like, if you plug something in, it just didn't work. Like today, now you just go, and it works. You're like, yeah. I, you had to figure things out and flip little switches. And I don't even know what the hell I did to get things to work sometimes. Because I didn't know anything about electronics, right? So that was like in the 90s. And, 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 and I got involved with stuff and just started learning DOS and stuff. Because and, I had some really nerdy uh, friends that were, uh, they were white. None of my Hispanic friends were, was involved with any of that stuff at that time. Um, so I learned a little bit about how to configure my computer. And then I got over to here, and then now I didn't have to worry about it anymore, right? I'm all happy. But this little line here represents to me a lot of lost people that never got exposed to breadboards or any electronics that we've lost them. What could they have done? What, what, what could have, what, where could we be today? I don't know. Um, that is one thing I thought of when I thought of this, that wow, like when, when I first got exposed to computers, it wasn't easy to get a computer. They were really expensive. You had to kind of put them together and you had to know a little bit about electronics to do it. The electronics thing is related to whiteness in the sense that in my community, there was like maybe one or two kids out of like, I don't know, 300, 400 kids that I knew that, that messed around with electronics. Maybe they had uh, somebody, uh, their dad or somebody did TV work or something. I had one cousin that liked to tear stuff apart, so he knew a little bit about electronics. But I think that uh, electronics goes along with whiteness in, in, in the sense that I'm talking about here in the time and place. The PCC employees I work with, I train people how to use the systems here at, at, at uh, PCC, and for the most part, they adhere to whiteness. And what I mean by that is, they know how to use the, co the computer systems that we've been talking about. They know what file files are, folders, and how all that stuff works. So the metaphors work for them pretty well. There's been occasion though when I've when I've said, "Hey, uh, grab your mouse," and I see somebody go like, "Like they don't they don't know what the mouse is." That, that first time that happened to me, it shocked me. I was like, "Wow, they don't know what a mouse is." I don't know, I didn't ask them where that came from or anything, but I was shocked. And, and so I'm saying that the PCC employees that I work with, they've been vetted to a certain extent in the, in the cultural sense that they're, they're already familiar with the office environment, right? In our world, that makes sense. But we should think about whiteness and, and, and how, that, how that interacts with, with what I'm talking about, I think. Um, Another thing I wanted to talk about, touches about what Ted and Michael mentioned a little bit, the, the cell phone thing. It's kind of exploded, right? Boom, everybody's got a cell phone. The digital divide used to be really, really big, right? For uh, between uh, whites and Latinos and blacks, American Indians, et cetera, indigenous people. So this slide right here is, is off of a, it's from 2010. It's from a, a, a project one of my friends did for Multnomah County Library how to serve Spanish-speaking patrons with cell phones and why they should do that, right? 2010, numbers have changed. They've grown as far as representation of Hispanics. This is from the Pew Center. You can see they're pretty close there. What is cell versus the cell internet? Cell phone and cell internet access, yes. 
question. Non-voice applications. Texting, look at that. 2010, they were even. That's kind of uh, mind-boggling, because at 2010, I was thinking total digital divide, like, whoa, it's so like completely separated. Texting isn't completely bridging the, the digital divide, but you're using the networks and getting familiarized. Data applications by cell phones and ethnicity. Access the internet, send and receive email, send and receive instant messages, posted a photo or video online. Yeah, some numbers from 2010. So what I'm getting at is I think the cell phone is really important and we need to think about using that to reach people um, that uh, have been marginalized. You can read this stuff. I'm not really into reading slides. Um, but um, I'd like you to think about this stuff. And uh, that's all I had to say for right now, and I'm glad I didn't have that much time. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.